I walked out of prison with literally a box that had nothing but paperwork in it that had accumulated over my prison sentence and the clothes on my back. That was everything I had in the world. I didn't know a single person. I had no idea where I even was in Seattle. I had no idea how to get from point A to point B. I didn't know the buses. I, I was in a completely foreign place with nothing. And there was a huge part of me that really just wanted to go back to prison. I was pretty heavy into drug use as it was. And in order to support my drug habit, I got into dealing with some pretty scary people. <laughs> and I was dealing very large quantities of methamphetamine. I started using drugs when I was very young. I was in and out of treatment centers and nothing really stuck. Uh, in January of 2004, I was convicted and charged of delivery and possession of methamphetamine. I went to women's, Washington's Correctional Center for Women um, in Gig Harbor, Washington, where I spent close to three years. On top of the prison sentence, I also received over $7,000 in legal financial obligations. I've got a fine for $3,500, and the interest on this one is 2,000 and something, because that has been accruing the entire time, you know, I was locked up and everything. And now there's this other one for $3,500 with another $800 interest added onto it. And that's just in a short period of time. So that's why I called, um, Northwest Justice Project, who directed me to um, Columbia Legal Services. And I was contacted by a gentleman by the name of Nick Allen. Good morning, my name is Nick Allen, and I'm an attorney with Columbia Legal Services. For the past several years, CLS and the ACLU of Washington have worked on addressing barriers to successful reentry from jail and prison that are caused by legal financial obligations, which are more commonly known as LFOs. Legal financial obligations, pretty straightforward. It's the fees, fines, costs, and restitution that are imposed by a court uh, as part of a criminal judgment and sentence. So if you get a conviction in Washington State, you get legal financial obligations as part of your sentence. Failure to pay LFOs often results in incarceration of indigent defendants. While the U.S. Supreme Court has outlawed debtors' prisons, every day in Washington State, people are incarcerated simply because they are too poor to pay their LFOs. Well, in the midst of moving from place to place and really trying to utilize every penny that I had just to survive, I didn't have the money to make the payments. It's really important to, to the way that our clients live their lives. For instance, with LFOs, if people have this debt that's hanging over their head for years and years, sometimes decades or the rest of their lives, they're never gonna be able to go back to living a life that, in which they're free. Did everything I could to make sure, you know, first of all, that I could survive. You know, had a roof over my head, um, was able to provide food for myself, and I was paying child support for my older son. So just in those things, the money was gone. Failure to pay LFOs is a common occurrence, and I think uh, that's one of the reasons that we have the clinic in place and why um, we're doing the work around LFOs is because, you know, uh, in theory, having legal financial obligations might make some sense because it assumes that you're going to have a wide range of people who are coming to the system and uh, will be able to pay them. But in practice, the majority of people coming through our system are, are indigent, uh, don't have the means to pay. The first time I was arrested, was completely homeless. I was asleep in a park in the middle of winter and was woke up by the police. And they informed me that I was not allowed to be sleeping 
in that particular area. And they ran my name and informed me that I had a warrant out of Benton County. What we found in particular is a stark example in Benton County, Washington, where approximately 20% of people in custody on any given day are there because they did not pay fines and fees. And I wasn't aware at the time that Benton County would arrest me for inability to make my payment. In our observation, Benton County courts did not engage in the constitutionally required inquiry into people's ability to pay. And, you know, I was doing the absolute very best that I could. I would send, you know, partial payments, or if I had missed a month, I would send double the next time, or, you know, anything I could possibly do to try and keep up. Benton County is one of the uh, counties in the state that we've heard and have investigated uh, in terms of their LFO collection and enforcement process, and she fit right into that uh, um, uh, example. She's someone who, um, you know, has criminal convictions, has turned her life around, uh, and is doing really good things now, is in school out here in, the, in King County, uh, but continues to, uh, you know, fear being arrested and incarcerated for failing to pay legal financial obligations. I've been arrested a total of four separate occasions for inability to make my legal financial obligation. It seemed like no matter how hard I was trying, every time I turned around, I was being arrested again. The reentry clinic provides legal assistance to low-income people uh, throughout the state who are facing barriers to uh, successful reintegration back into the community. Uh, following their release from prison or jail, um, and those barriers can either be caused by legal financial obligations uh, or uh, a criminal conviction uh, that prevents them from accessing housing and, or, and or employment. The clinic is staffed by uh, institutions project staff um, as well as volunteer attorneys uh, throughout the community who, um, who have taken an interest in this issue and, and have wanted to volunteer. The Institutions Project has been part of CLS for over 30 years. Um, we focus on helping people who are institutionalized in the state of Washington. Um, so a lot of our clients, most of our clients are in prisons or jails, but we also help people who are in um, mental health facilities, immigration detention, juvenile detention facilities. And our, our goal is to work on um, the issue, the reasons that people are institutionalized in the first place, the conditions that they face while they're institutionalized, and helping um, avoid reinstitutionalization once people are released. In 2011, the last time that I was arrested, um, I had just found out a couple of months before that I was pregnant with my almost two-year-old. Come on, this way, turn. You know, and the thought of losing him just almost destroyed me. I was terrified to even have him because I was so afraid I was going to lose him. <laughs> Valerie's got a, a great story and we wanted to make sure that we stayed in contact with her, um, not only because of the, the county that she's from, but just because uh, she really serves as a great example of somebody uh, who it has successfully re-entered back into the community and if she could just address these legal financial obligations she'd be on even a better path to that re-entry and, uh, and could focus on her children and her education and her uh, future uh, employment prospects instead of having to worry about uh, her past and, uh, and the debt that's been uh, imposed upon her. I've been accepted into a program called post-prison education I am a full-time 4.0 student at um, Highline Community College. I am working on uh, eventually my master's, but right now my associate's in social work. For me, it has a lot to do with freedom and liberty and being able to kind of pay your debt to society, move on. And it's the same with addressing, you know, employment and housing. You've, you've done your sentence and you still have to pay the price. It's like the shackles never come off. My ultimate goal is to get my master's with social work with an emphasis on child development. 
and to open a supervised visitation facility for um, low-income parents who need visitations with their children.